I, I want you to just keep your Bible open in chapter 2 tonight, just as you did last night in chapter 4, as we talked about uh, the security that we have in Christ. And, and we really dealt with the fact that our security in Christ is in the fact of His presence, simply in His peace, and then in His power. And tonight what I want to do is I want to talk to you, since I quoted last night, verse 5 of chapter 2, I want to speak to you on the subject of how to have the mind of Christ. And I'm going to cover a lot of verses, so the scripture is going to speak for itself. And what I have found through these years is sometimes just let the scripture speak. Because it means what it says, and it says what it means. And so tonight, I'm just going to walk through uh, this chapter with you and, and help us understand how to have the mind of Christ. Now, I was told a long time ago by my mother, and my mother was a little short five-foot-one lady that uh, I believe the reason that the four boys and the daughter turned out uh, and, and girl turned out as good as they did was because of my mother. Now, my dad got saved, his life changed, and he became a bivocational pastor. But my mother, uh, there was something about her that she demanded your respect. And uh, she didn't put up with a lot of foolishness. Uh, my daddy whooped me four times. There's a difference between a whipping and a whooping. I got four whoopings, and I can tell you all of them. My mama beat me every day of my childhood. I mean, I think she looked for moments to beat me. But one of the things that she did teach me, and I remember it well, I guess I must have been about in the third or fourth grade, is she said, and, and I'll never forget this, in one of those mornings, in one of those rages, in one of those fits I was pitching, and she was going to show me who the boss was, she said, this is what she said, you determine which side of the bed you wake up on. Because I said, well, I just woke up. I just woke up feeling bad. I woke up in a bad mood. And after some time with discipline, she said, you determine what side of the bed you wake up on. Own. And you know, I've never forgotten that. And I believe biblically that is a good principle to live by. You determine if you're going to have a good day or a bad day. Now, sometimes circumstances in your life you can control because it's dealing with you and your attitude. But there are other times there are circumstances in your life that you cannot control. However, you determine what side of the bed you wake up on, and you determine whether you're going to have a good day or a bad day. You make that decision. You say, well, how do you do it? Well, Paul writes about it. He is in a Roman jail. Chains, bonds, fetters, praetorian guards, dark, dreary dungeon. And Paul writes about it when he says in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, that sounds big. I believe if we were to look at that passage of Scripture in a better way of maybe in our vernacular of understanding it would be this. Uh, have the attitude or the disposition of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have the attitude or the disposition of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to use verses 1 and 4 just as an introduction and then I want to share with you four principles and four ways that you can have the attitude and the mind of Christ. And you say, Brother Tommy, we're talking about revival. Well, I believe that's where revival begins. It starts within your attitude. It starts within your life. You know, there's a battle for the mind going on. I'll never forget hearing as a young preacher boy down in South Alabama, hearing Fred Wolf preach on that subject, the battle for the mind. And it's very important to understand that when Satan comes after us, he attacks, first of all, the mind. It is a thought, a mind, and then we act upon it, and then the next thing you know, it can become a spiritual stronghold, or it can become a spiritual strength for us. But yet it all begins with that thinking process, that thing which is called the mind. Well, as I look at verses 1 through 4, I see something of great introduction here, because Paul is trying to set the stage to help you understand how to have the mind of Christ. He says, therefore, because remember in chapter 1, you've got the philosophy for Christian living. For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And now he says, therefore. 
if there is any consolation, since there's consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, and then he says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, listen to this, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Uh, I got saved uh, in July of 1969. I had not yet turned 10 years of age, and uh, that was a great time for our family. And so that following year in 1970, I was able to attend my first summer camp as a 10-year-old boy. Now, you can imagine how small I was at the age of 10. But they loaded us up on a bus, and we went uh, uh, to a place called Camp Joy. Now, this Camp Joy was important for me because it was run by the Valley Rescue Mission. And I, I later on went back and pastored right across from the Valley Rescue Mission for uh, over t 11 years there in Columbus. And, and so I knew that and it was a great relationship. But when I was 10 years of age, I went to Camp Joy. I mean, they loaded us up on a bus, cost about $25 a kid. And we were going for a whole week and, and we didn't give the $25. Somebody sent us there on a scholarship. And so we got to Camp Joy. And I'll never forget walking into their worship setting because behind the pulpit area of their worship setting was uh, the word joy, J. O Y, joy. But underneath the J was the word Jesus. Underneath the O was others. And then underneath the Y was you. And that week they taught us a priority for our life was that Jesus is first, others second, and yourself, you, last. Years later, I learned that song that we used to sing in Baptist Life that said, Others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I may live for thee. And I thought, wow. And so during that whole camp, certainly they promoted to us the person of Jesus Christ, but they taught us also that others come before yourself. Well, in this writing, in this introduction, that's what Paul says. He says, don't think too highly of yourself. Instead, Jesus is first, others are second, and yourself is last. And if you're going to have joy in your life, I want to say that again. If you're going to have joy in your life, the priority of your life must be Jesus first. Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. That others in this state, statement here, simply that we don't uh, put ourselves ahead of others, but they have priority over us and then you. Now, this is what I hear a lot of times, and I don't do the counseling that I used to do anymore, Brother Chris. I used to do a lot of it, and, and I just finally found out the only reason they were coming to me was because I was cheap. They didn't have to pay me. And, and then they begin to have all these type of problems, Brother Lee, and, and, you know, and I can't give them medication. And there are so many difficulties and struggles. And so I see people normally uh, once or twice at most, and I'll do couples, and I'll do guys if it's about spiritual matters. But with so many other issues in our society and culture, I just don't do much counseling anymore. But when I did, and still on occasions when they'll come in first before I refer them and I pray with them and talk to them, uh, oftentimes this is what I hear from men and women. I'm tired of doing everything else for everybody else. I'm going to think about myself for a while. You remember what I told you what Zig Ziglar said last night? That is stinking thinking, and it is wrong biblically. Think about yourself. Wait a minute. You're going to be selfish? You're going to look inside your own self and say, oh, no, it's all about me. I, I, me, me, mine, mine. That's what's wrong with our culture now. There is too much individualism. It's not about working together as a team. It's not working together as a unit. It's not about working together as a family. It's not even working together as a church. 
So what do you do for me? And so Paul opens up in chapter 2, and he is trying to get them to see how to have the mind of Christ. And the first thing he deals with is if you're going to have joy, and remember this is a joy book, right? If you're going to have joy, you got to get it right. The adults have got to get it right. The children have got to get it right. It is Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. Do you know that would solve every marital problem? Did you know that would solve every problem with rearing children? Did you know that would solve the problem in our culture today if those of us who are believers would realize and believe and trust that it's the joy that God wants us to have is always Jesus first, others second, yourself last. So at that first camp, that's what they taught me as a 10-year-old boy. Now here I am 50 plus years later and I'm telling you that that principle that I was taught will help you have the mind of Christ. So how do you have it? Number one, I believe, first of all, that you must humble yourself as Christ humbled himself. You must humble yourself as Christ humbled himself. You'll notice within this text, he says, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Listen to this. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, I can preach a whole sermon on that, but tonight you're just kind of getting a shorter version. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance or in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of the death, even the death of the cross. You want to have the attitude of the Lord Jesus? Have humility. Do you understand who Jesus is? Jesus is God. Just as much God is God, yet just as much man is man, Jesus is the God-man. God the incarnate, God in the flesh. And Jesus left the portals and the throne of heaven and came to a sinful world. And yet being born of a virgin, yes, I said a virgin, a spouse to Joseph named Mary. And being born of that virgin, Jesus being born in that stall, the son, earthly father of just a carpenter, and Jesus Christ lived a life like you and like me, yet the Bible says he never ever sinned out of Hebrews, and yet now the Lord Jesus Christ is willing, the son of the living God, the son of God, the son of man, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ is willing to give himself up as a ransom of upon a cross of Calvary for your sin and mine. He humbled himself. Do you know the death of the cross was the most humiliating death of that time? And, and he, he hung between not only heaven and hell, but he hung between two thieves. Now, this is the creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is the sustainer of all of life. This is the savior of the world. But yet, wasn't it John the Baptist who looked and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so upon the cross of Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ took upon the sin of the world. He humbled himself. Years ago, I used to love to sing that song. He could have called 10,000 angels. Yes, he could have. As a matter of fact, he could have just thought it and he could have come down off that cross he didn't have to do that. Hey, everybody says, well, the, the Jews killed Jesus. The Romans killed Jesus. I killed Jesus. I want you to listen to me. Jesus voluntarily gave himself up for your life and for mine. He humbled himself. Pride goes right before what? The fall. Oh, God, teach us humility. If Jesus Christ would humble himself to the point of dying on a cross for a sinful world, yet never sin, can you imagine how Jesus must have felt on the cross? Can't you still hear those words? My God, my God, 
Why hast thou forsaken me? Can you imagine what he must have felt? And you know, it was because of my sin, your sin, that Jesus humbled himself. You know what the Bible says? God demonstrated his love toward us in that while I was yet a sinner, Jesus Christ died for me. He humbled himself. Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm, I've got this little pen up here. That's a, that's a Georgia Baptist pen, isn't it, Brother Steve? I even got a Georgia Baptist shirt on. I was going to just wear it without a jacket, but I've got a stain on it right there, so I'm trying to cover it up. And uh, I, I must have got too close to eating or something, and Diane's just looking at me like, Tommy, don't tell that. But uh, I, get, I get mesmerized sometimes. I, maybe not stop the word. I get stunned sometimes and just shocked at how that preachers look like peacocks at conventions. And even in the pulpit, it blows me away. They're arrogant. They're proud. I mean, it's, it's all about them. Now, I can talk about us because I is one. I've been one for 42 years. And uh, we're too arrogant. Uh, we're too conscientious about large churches, big budgets. Uh, you know the good news about this? There are no big shots with the Lord Jesus. We're just all his children. And, and then have you ever noticed some parents, how that they're always so boastful and so proud? Look what I have. Can I just remind you of something? Everything you have comes from the Father above. It's all his anyway. But yet arrogance goes before. Uh, I, I have to be careful with that myself. Uh, I struggle sometimes. Now, I grew up in a very poverty setting where my dad was a drug addict and an alcoholic in the projects of Columbus, Georgia. And, and I struggle now. Sometimes, I, you know, I, I, I like to... Uh, I like to take pictures of my yard. Has anybody ever seen any pictures of my yard? I love to take pictures of my yard, Miss Connie. And, and, and you, you know why? Because I grew up on asphalt. I mean, and for me to have grass is, is, you know, not the other grass, but, you know, green grass. I mean, I, I'm proud of those things. And, 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 and my, I keep my car clean. I, I'm just I'm overly conscientious because as I grew up, I never had anything. And so now, what little bit I have, I do my best to keep it nice. I mean, we can live in a home that's a, a thousand square feet or a home that's three, and now we're in a home with about 1,900. I mean, we can live, but whatever I have, I do my best because I want it to look nice, and sometimes pride gets in the way. And I struggle with that. I'll be honest with you. I want everything at church to be just done just right. I mean, the floors have to be just clean. The walls have to be nice and neat. I want the services to go ta 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 ta. I don't want any blemishes. And, and you know what's so funny about that? You technology folks, I hate technology. I absolutely hate it. And, uh, you know, you can have the best service planned, and now everything is technology-driven. I mean, we got all the lights, and we got all the sound, and we've got all the... we got a screen bigger than this whole wall. I mean, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, 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 and when it messes up, you know what I do? I panic. I'm sitting there on my front row, and, and everybody in the sound booth knows. And we even got a production manager now. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. Just take the Bible and preach the Word. And, and so I'm sitting there, and, and Lee, I'm telling you, and I'll sit down, and if something doesn't happen just right, they know we don't do We just text. And they'll see it coming, you know. You know, I, I'll be up there about ready to preach, and it ain't just right. And I'll go, you know, I want it right. Y'all listen to me. I believe every one of us in this room struggle to the point sometimes we're just too proud. And we need to humble ourselves because it's all about the Lord Jesus. And if Jesus was willing to humble himself, then you and I could humble ourselves and we can make sure that we put Jesus first, others second, and ourselves last. Let me move on to the second thought. I believe that can help you to have the attitude of Christ. But also, secondly, I want you to listen to what I have to say in verses 9 through 11. If you humble yourself as Christ humbled himself, secondly, you got to highly exalt Christ as God exalted him. Highly exalt Christ as God highly 
exalted him. You say, what does it mean? Well, look in the passage of Scripture, verse 9. The Bible says, therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, listen, to the glory of God. So God the Father. Now it's important to understand that God himself realized that Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary was the son of the living God. So in the midst of Jesus crying out and saying, my God, my God, why thou hast thou forsaken me, he also, Jesus, began to cry out. And remember, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And I believe the last words were, it is finished. Now, you know in the Greek what that means. It's done. It's complete. Teletestai. However you say that, I'm not a Greek scholar. Yes, listen to me closely. God exalted Jesus on a place called Golgotha place of the skull, a hill called Calvary, and yet God exalted Jesus. To what extent that the Bible says that one of these days, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is no other name given among men whereby men can be saved except by the name of Jesus. Jesus declared himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And on that day when the disciples stood afar off, and on that day when some looked up and said, yeah, tell us about the king of the Jews. Tell us about the king of kings. I'm telling you, when darkness fell that day and when the graves burst open and the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom, that was God saying, I have exalted my son in whom I am well pleased. And from the very beginning of his ministry at that baptism to the very end of the crucifixion, he exalted Jesus. Oh, Friday was difficult. But Sunday was a coming. And on that day when they went to the tomb and the angel said, he is not here, he is risen. God highly exalted Jesus. And that's why Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw men to myself. So you know what has to happen for you and, my, you and me to have the mind of Christ and the attitude of Christ? We, we not only must humble ourselves, we must highly exalt Jesus. I tell you, I love the old song that we used to sing when I was a student down at BBI. Oh, Mike Griffin and I started the school down there, Brother Steve, together in 1981. We, he, we tell everybody it was called Baptist Bible Institute. We tell everybody we were institutionalized. And... Uh, I could still hear it in that, in that R.G. Lee chapel when we'd start singing. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. It's Jesus. So you and I in our life, we have to lift up Jesus. In, in our singing, we ought to always lift up Jesus. And our preaching will to always lift up Jesus. And our living will to always lift up Jesus. And our witnessing will to always lift up Jesus. I mean, we're told in our state of Georgia that there are seven million people who are lost. And do you know the only way for them to get saved is that you and I might exalt Jesus, lift him up so that they might come to a saving knowledge. It's not going to help us at all, at all, 
if we become a stronger state financially, if we become the political state that some want us to be, it's not going to help us at all if we decide, well, we're just going to have good morals and good values. I'm telling you, that won't last long, but I'm telling you, Jesus lasts for eternity. And the only thing I can say you, to you tonight to help you and to help me, making sure I have the right attitude and that right disposition and have the mind of Christ, I have to lift Jesus up. I'm concerned of what's happening in churches today. I really am. Altar calls are not being given anymore. Not at your church. Uh, I don't ever have to worry about First Baptist Church Auburn hearing a good Jesus message. Your preacher is a very gifted preacher. Gifted preacher. Powerful preacher. And, uh, but in some of our churches today, we have lost. Now, 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 I'm not talking about styles of music. Not at all. You know, we fought that war. That was stupid. Pardon the expression. Uh, that's that project language coming out of me. That was stupid. Why in the world we ever fought that battle? That was dumb as a brick. And uh, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about whether you have chairs or pews. I, I'm not talking about whether you got a steeple or you don't have a steeple. I'm not speaking about any of that at all. But what concerns me most is that we're not having men of God stand in the pulpits of God and declare the word of God and let people know the Bible says in John 1, 1, you know it all. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And you and I have got to exalt Jesus. And you know what I'm finding out? It still works. Some people, oh, no, no, no. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Every Friday uh, during football season, I meet with about 80 football players. And I'm blessed that I have a coach who's a believer. But every Friday, every Friday, I tell those boys about Jesus. And you know, just a few weeks ago, two of those boys gave their hearts and life to Jesus. We got a young girl, and I do that with basketball as well. I'm blessed that, that we, we have a Christian basketball coach and, and, uh, and, a, and a young man and a young lady who are Christians. And, and I know you say, well, you can't do that in the schoolhouse. Yeah, you can. Uh, I just say, hey, I'm there at FCA. I'm there with FCA. And, and so I can share with them the gospel. And then I say, if you'd like to talk to me, come talk with me. Come share with me. Let me know where you are. And, and, and I, I, don't, uh, over, I don't take advantage at all. When we go into the schools where we are, this is what we say. What can we do to help you? And when there is a crisis, do you know who they call? They call me. And they say, can you bring your staff? Can you help us? We're going through a crisis right now where one of our, uh, one of our uh, very, very gifted little defensive backs uh, and a state wrestler uh, didn't do anything wrong on a Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock. He goes off the road. He may have been speeding. I'm not sure, but he goes off the road, tries to correct, and slams into a tree. And now he's got this major, massive brain injury, and, and his body is, looks good. He's fine, but we don't know exactly what's going to go on. But you know what happened? Coach called me and said, we want to pray. And so we had over 100 people one night and about 200 the next night come and pray at our church. And, and they said, we want to give money. And you know where they're bringing the money? They're bringing the money to our church, and we're keeping it up with it and giving it to the family. And, and, and all I'm saying to you is this. Just exalt Jesus. Lift him up. The world needs Jesus. I want to hurry up, and I will, I promise, preacher. I want you to see this third point. I want you to hear me. If you're going to have an attitude of Christ, and if I'm going to have, Paul writes, and he says, you humble yourself, as Christ humbled himself, you highly exalt Jesus as God highly exalted him. And then thirdly, and I'm going to use this word. Now, I know there's a difference between happiness and joy. I know that. But to alliterate it, you got to be happy in Jesus like Paul was happy in Jesus. Are you okay with that, preacher? All right, look at the text. Look at the text. Listen to what he says. Therefore, 
my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Now, I could deal with this a long time, but just kind of follow along. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do. Now, listen to this. He is for his good pleasure. Verse 14, do all things without complaining and disputing. Can I read that one more time? Do all things. <laughs> Don't nudge your husband, ma'am. Without complaining and disputing. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Isn't that where we are? Among whom you shine as what? Lights in the world holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on a sacrifice and service of your faith, listen to what he says. He says, I am glad, and he's got a southern twang there, and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Remember last night, chapter 4, verse 4? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness, your conduct, your lifestyle, the old King James, your moderation be known to all men. The happiest people in the world ought to be Christians. And if you have the attitude of Jesus... You cannot help but be happy. Does that mean that you're not going to have troubles? We dealt with that last night. Oh, no. Does it mean that you're not going to have a toothache from time to time? Oh, no. Does it mean that your eyesight's not going to get bad as you get older and fat and have all these issues? Oh, no. But you know what? Diane and I on the way home last night, we called to speak to Miss Marilyn. Miss Marilyn this morning had a heart uh, a pacemaker put in her heart. But I've been her pastor for seven years. And this lady for seven years has struggled physically to such an extent. You may have to help me, Diane. The first thing that she had when we got there is she had to have stem cell done, leukemia, etc. cetera. And, and seven years ago was different than what it is now. It's much easier now than what it was seven years ago. And, and she had to go to Emory. And, and then she had all types of other health issues. She fell and broke a hip. She broke another hip. Her husband got sick. Her husband died. And she's having problem after problem, physical crisis after physical crisis. And last night, when we called her on the phone to pray with her, because we can't go to the hospital anymore right now, and we called her just to say, hey, we're praying for you. I want to tell you, after I prayed, I got off the phone, and she encouraged me more than I encouraged her. She's happy. And she said, I, she, this is what she said. She said, oh, the Lord and I, we done had our conversation. We done had a talk. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to do what he wants me to do no matter what. And she said, I, I'm going to keep on. And listen, that little lady is everywhere. She's happy in Jesus. And I believe that if you're going to have the attitude, have, have you ever been around somebody that's just miserable all the time? Boy, they bother me. I, I had to determine years ago, Brother Chris, that I could not surround myself with negative, pessimistic thinking, stinking thinking people. I had to determine that. And I did. I just made that mind. My best friends are not going to be negative, pessimistic people. I'm not going to allow pessimistic people to be in leadership in my church. They'll drive you crazy. Always wanting this and that. Nothing's ever right. And, and they're always moaning and groaning and complaining. And the Bible says don't complain, don't dispute, quit all that stuff. And, and to be happy, rejoice in the Lord. Man, I mean, I want to see folks when they walk into church, I want them to walk into church going, hey, we, we don't know what's going to happen today. I mean, man, we don't know uh, what kind of song we're going to sing. We don't know who's going to baptize. When we sing, we rejoice. When we baptize, we rejoice. Whatever we do. Oh, Wayne Hamrick taught me a long time ago, whatever I do, celebrate it. Rejoice. Celebrate. So we celebrate a lot. 
I, look, I'm always looking to have a party. There's always a reason to have a party. Find something to celebrate. I, I don't ever want to be known as an old, cantankerous old man. And I certainly wouldn't want any of you ladies to be known as an old, cantankerous old lady. You want to be known as someone who's happy. I, I like Miss Marilyn's attitude last night. She encouraged me instead of me encouraging her. I'm not done. Almost. Almost. Now think about it. So if you're going to have the attitude of Christ, we're asking for revival, you, you've got to understand you've got to humble yourself. I have to humble myself. You've got to understand that you've got to get to the point we highly exalt Jesus. It's all about Jesus. You've got to get to that point that you're happy in Christ, that you're rejoicing what the Lord has done in your life. Now, here's the last part. You've got to be holy like Timothy and Epaphroditus were holy. I want to just read the text. You know Timothy was Paul's son in the ministry. Epaphroditus was one of his messenger boys as well. And Epaphroditus was willing to die for the cause of Christ. And I just want to read the text and let you see how these men walked with God. Look at the Bible. Here's what he says in verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy, my son in the ministry, to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state, your condition. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, but you know his proven, listen to this, character, his holiness. He walked with God. You know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him all once, at once rather, as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall come shortly. That's Timothy. Now listen to number two. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Says he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard Epaphroditus was sick. For indeed he was sick almost, the Bible says, unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should show, have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. Why? Because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. I want to say two things to you here, and I want you to listen. Timothy, raised by Lois and Eunice, under now the wings of the ministry of the Apostle Paul, has been given a great deal of responsibility. Can I tell you why? Because of his character. He was holy. He walked with God. I don't know why we don't talk about holiness anymore. Greg Fazell has written a great book on the holiness of God. I, I don't know why we don't talk about what it means when the Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, thus saith the Lord. Uh, the Bible teaches us that when we get saved, we become a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And let me just put it to you this way. The only thing that really matters in your life and my life, y'all listen to this. This is going to be profound, and I don't say much profound, but this is pretty decent thinking. The only thing that matters is our testimony. testimony. That is what matters the most. How do we love Jesus? Is he first in our life? How do we look upon others? Don't think too highly upon yourselves. Esteem others 
And then where do you put yourself? Here's the good news. We are children of the Most High God. I mean, we're, we're children of the King. I mean, we, we, we've been bought with the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in the midst of everything that I've said, you and I are privileged people. Most all of you in this room, I still know you from a few years back. And, and we are privileged people. And, and some of you have not changed. Right? You still have a heart for God. But this is what I want to say to you. If Timothy had character and Epaphroditus was willing to die for the cause of Christ, you and I have it pretty easy. Why can't we have the attitude of Jesus even in the culture in which we live in in 2020? Can I tell you, it's not near as bad as you think it is. It's not. He hadn't gone to jail yet. You hadn't gone to jail yet. You hadn't gone to jail yet. I haven't gone to jail yet. I mean, we're sitting in a nice still setting here. I mean, nobody's told us we can't go to church. Our governor's never said you could not go to church. We are blessed beyond measure. We are a blessed people. But whether you got a lot of money or a little money, whether you got a lot of education or a little education, if you're a child of the Lord Jesus Christ, this passage of Scripture applies to you. And you know what the Bible says? Every one of us ought to have the mind of Christ. Because we're going to humble ourselves. We're going to highly exalt Jesus. We're going to be happy. My joy and my happiness is not based upon my circumstance. My joy and my happiness is based upon the Christ in whom I serve. And then I'm going to be separated. I'm going to be holy. I'm not going to go the places I used to go. I'm not going to do the things I used to do. I'm not going to say the things I used to say. My life has been radically changed for eternity. So the question tonight, on this second night, how's your attitude? This is really good food for thought. And I didn't add a whole lot to it. I pretty much just read the text. That's what we do. Tonight, I want to ask you two things. One, as a believer, are you willing to say, I want to have the attitude, the mind of Jesus? Are you willing? If you are tonight, I'm going to ask you to fill this altar. I really am. I'm going to ask you to fill this altar to such an extent. And if you can't kneel, you can come and be seated on these. Every Baptist church leaves these front pews open in front of you, you know, so you can come kneel and be seated. Or you can come and stand. You can be a member of this church or a guest. It doesn't matter. It's your testimony. It's my testimony. And it's a commitment that you make to the Lord Jesus because you do determine what side of the bed you wake up on. Number two, if you've never met Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm telling you, I told you tonight, the only way of salvation is Jesus. Pastor Chris will be available here. All you got to do is come up and say, I need Jesus. Hey, he knows what to do. This man knows how to share the gospel. He gives tracts out. They do all types. You just come and say, I need Jesus. Now, here's my hope and my goal. I always preach for a verdict. Always. I pray that you'll leave this room better than when you came in. I want you to stand with me. And I want to pray. And I want some music to be played. Whatever is going to be done. And I'm going to get over here by myself. And uh, if you want to join me, feel free to do so. And I'm just going to ask the Lord touch my life and to give me that right attitude. Father, would you bless tonight? Lord, uh, this room is filled with people who love you. And Father, I, maybe you just need to do a little attitude adjustment. 
I ask you to do that tonight. Do it in my life. Help me to practice what I preach. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, would you please send revival to each and every one of us in this room. And may we humble ourselves tonight and say we need Jesus. There's no one else. No one else we need but Jesus. And we're going to love God and we're going to love people. And we're going to make sure that our testimony and character is right and that we love him with all of our hearts. God, would you do it tonight? In Jesus' name I pray, amen.